we're fortunate that we have the suttas to get an idea of how the Buddha would apply his teachings. You can imagine what it would be like if we only had just lists of Dharma topics, terms to find. It would be like having a course of medicine where all you had was the lists of the different medicines that could be used, but you wouldn't know how to use them. You wouldn't have any examples of how the Buddha used the teachings. It's through the suttas, especially the dialogues, where someone comes to see the Buddha, he's got a problem or a question, and the Buddha responds with a teaching that's just right for that particular problem, just right for that particular person. Sometimes it is the problem, sometimes it's the person. It's unfortunate that we are not native speakers of Pali, because then we could probably read in the way the person expressed himself what clues were given as to what kind of person he was. We got a few cases. There's one case there was this really smart-ass teenager. He's finished all of his training as a Brahmin, and he has very pompous questions to get an idea of who he is. And there's a case of Pasenadi, the king. He comes and asks questions of the Buddha. And he's kind of like some presidents we have and have had in the past, who can't quite speak right. He phrases a question, and the Buddha says, what do you mean by that? And then the king states another question, which is totally unrelated to the first, or only tangentially. His grammar is bad. So you get an idea of him as a person. At the very least, we can tell when someone comes with a problem and the Buddha gives an answer. You get an idea of how the particular Dharma medicines are used. Because, as he pointed out, of his teachings there are only two that are categorical. In other words, true across the board. One is that skillful action should be developed, unskillful action should be abandoned. And here, unskillful actions would apply, say, to the precepts. Killing, stealing, having illicit sex, lying, taking intoxicants. Those things are unskillful across the board and they should never be done across the board. The other categorical teaching is, as I said, the Four Noble Truths. The nature of suffering is always the same. The nature of its cause, its origination, is always the same. And the duties that fall to the truths are always duties that are incumbent on us. To comprehend suffering, abandon its cause, realize its cessation, and develop the path that attacks the problem at the cause. So these things are true across the board. However, there are other teachings that may be true across the board, but they're not beneficial across the board. The categorical teaching is always true, always beneficial. But you get something, say, like the three characteristics, or more properly, the three perceptions of inconstancy, stress, not self. There are cases in the canon where people try to apply those teachings and the Buddha reprimands them, that this is not the place to apply that teaching. One case is of a young monk who's been asked by some sectarians, what does the Buddha teach as the result of action? And the monk says, well, the result of action is pain. And the sectarians say, we've never heard any other Buddhist monks say it that way. You better go back and check. So the monk goes back, talks to Ananda, and Ananda takes him to the Buddha. And the Buddha says, that's the wrong time for that teaching. Where did you ever hear me say that action always results in pain? There's another monk, Udayan, who's listening in. He said, well, maybe this monk was thinking about the fact that all feelings are painful, all feelings are dukkha. And since actions result in feeling, all actions would, would result in pain. And the Buddha said, here's another fool. When you're talking about karma, you talk about the three kinds of feeling. Pleasant, painful, neither pleasant nor painful. Because when you're talking about karma, the question is what to do. What would be the skillful thing to do? What would be the skillful thing not to do? 
And if you saw it, taught that all actions lead to pain, what impetus would there be to do anything skillful? And strictly speaking, it wouldn't be true anyhow, because there, there are those four kinds of action. The actions that are bright, those that are dark, those that are neither bright nor dark, and those that are both bright and dark. And the path to the end of suffering is neither dark nor bright. In other words, it doesn't lead to a good rebirth, it doesn't lead to a bad rebirth. It goes beyond rebirth. It says it's the kind of action that leads to the end of action. But it is an action. When you're following the path, there are things you've got to do. It's only at the very last moment of the path that you drop all action. But up to that point, you have to keep on making the choice what is skillful and what is not skillful. And the path does lead to something beyond just a feeling of pain. It leads to a pleasure that's not even a feeling. It doesn't come under the five aggregates. It's the bliss of nibbana. Action doesn't cause it, but actions can take you there. Just like the road to the Grand Canyon doesn't cause the Grand Canyon to be, but you follow the road and you get there. So when you're thinking about action, when you're thinking about what to do in your life, always keep that in mind. There are skillful actions and unskillful actions. You want to do everything you can to avoid the unskillful ones across the board. And engage in skillful actions. Well, even the Buddhist definition of skillful action leads leaves a lot of leeway, so you have lots of choices. As long as you don't kill or steal, have illicit sex, lie, or take intoxicants, the range is pretty wide. And you have to decide for yourself what would lead to the best results. That's why the Buddha doesn't just give us the precepts, he also gives us questions to ask when we're trying to decide what to do. What do you expect will the results of your actions be? If you expect any harm at all, you don't do them. You act only on your skillful intentions. And then while you're acting, if you see any harm coming up unexpectedly, well, you stop. What that means, of course, is that your intention was not fully informed, it wasn't totally skillful. You don't see any problems, any harm in your actions, and you continue until you're finished. And then when you're finished, you look at the long-term results. Because maybe something didn't show any harm while you were doing it, but the harm came out later. You make up your mind not to repeat that mistake. So the Buddha gives you not only some basic guidelines, but also of what to do and what not to do, but also basic guidelines on how to figure out for yourself what to do and what not to do. So you're moving from simply knowing the medicine that he gives you to knowing how to apply it. The medicine of skillful action, the medicine of the Four Noble Truths. As we follow the path, we're going to go through stages and layers and layers of skillful actions and then actions that are more skillful and then that are more skillful. We further fine-tune our understanding of what's skillful and what's not. This is how we develop our right view. We start out with the right view that we hear from someone else, or we read from someone else, and then we think it through. And then if we thought it through, then we put it into practice, and our discernment will grow, get more refined, more specific. Sharper and sharper. So even though we might say that all feelings are painful and actions lead to feelings, you can't say that all actions lead to pain. So that's a case where the three characteristics don't apply. They may be true, as we chanted just now, they're true whether there's a Buddha or not. But they're not always beneficial. So you have to have a sense of time and place when to apply them. There's a similar incident where the Buddha is talking about how the five aggregates are not self. And a monk in the assembly says, well, if the five aggregates are not self, then what self is there going to be who's going to be affected by what is done by not self? 
In other words, it's the old question, when there, if there is no self, then, then, then dot, dot, dot. The Buddha reads a monk's minds and calls him a fool. Because the Buddha never said there is no self, never said there was a self. But he teaches not self as a tool for figuring out what to hold on to and what not to hold on to. And again, it's going to depend on time and place, how you apply that. We're working on the path. You hold on to your precepts, you hold on to your topic of concentration, the frame of reference that you use for mindfulness. The discernment that develops. You hold on to these things as you use them. The image they give in the forest tradition is that you're making a piece of furniture and you've got tools. And you know which tool to pick up and which time and which one to put down. You don't carry them all around all the time. But you do have to hold on to them tight while you're using them. And then when the piece of furniture is done, then you put them all down. So as you're on the path, as the Buddha said, you have to be your own mainstay. As he says, the self is its own mainstay. The self is a governing principle to inspire you to keep on wanting to practice because you're going to benefit from the practice. And you have your sense of self as being capable of doing this. It's a kind of conceit. You think that other people have found true release the practice. They're human beings, you're a human being. If they can do it, why can't you? Venerable Nanda actually says you encourage that kind of conceit. So the teaching on not-self is not to be used all the time. It has to have its right time and right place. When to pick up the hammer, when to pick up the screwdriver, when to pick up the nails, and when to put them down. That requires that you have a clear sense that some things are true across the board and others have to be gauged as to, is this the right time and place for that? That monk who answered that there was only one, res one result of action, which was pain. He was a young monk, brand new. Which is one of the reasons why young monks are not encouraged to teach. They may know the list of medicines. But it's like giving medicine for a cold to something else, for some other disease. So this is why we, it takes a while to learn the Dhamma. You can learn the, the concepts, you can learn the ideas in just a couple hours. But to know how, how to use them is going to take time, because it requires trial and error. You look at other people, you learn from their mistakes, you learn from things that they do that are not mistakes. And your sense of the right time and the right place will grow. This is one of the qualities you try to develop. It's called ka kalanyu, knowing the right time and place for things. So be prepared to make some mistakes, but ideally you want to learn from them. And that's how you get a sense of the right time and place, how to use this list of medicines, how to recognize exactly what disease you have right now, which medicine is going to be right for that disease. When you know that, that's when you're a master of the Dharma. When I was in college, a monk was invited to come give a talk. And then one of the professors, who was comparative religion, asked him a question about not self. The question started, well, if there is no self, then dot, dot, dot. I can't remember the details of the question. And the monk looked at him and said, well, you're still young and inexperienced. It'll take a while for you to figure out the answer to that. At the time, I was shocked. I thought, well, here's my, this was a teacher of mine, and he had a PhD. 
But since I've learned, the old monk was right. It's going to take time. This is what the Buddha said. Qualifications he's looking for in his students were one, that you're honest, and two, you're observant. In other words, you act, and then you look at the results, and then you learn. And you keep on acting and looking and learning. And that's how you get to cure your diseases. With the right medicine at the right time and place.